undercover lover of Jesus, not so undercover lover of Jesus. Come on and just have breakfast, sit with somebody, talk to them, and ask for who you, where you're from, and have a chance to open your heart. So let's just go pray that through. This way you don't have to feed your family. You can bring them here and feed them. Just like going to IHOP. So anyway, so pray through that. But this morning, we're in Matthew chapter 12. We're going to be in Matthew 12, and then we're going to read Acts 2. So if you have your Bibles, phones, pads, whatever you may be using, start with that Matthew chapter 12, and then Acts 2. Jesus. Beginning verse 46 of Matthew 12. While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Yes, if you did not know, Jesus had biological brothers and sisters from Mary and Joseph. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he shot his hand to his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Forever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So what does Jesus quantify? Spiritual family relations with him. How does it quantify? Simple. He who does the will of my father. Make it simple. He who does their very best in life to reveal my heart and the heart of heaven in their life. To walk with me. Who's doing their best to have a personal relationship with me. That's who my brother, mother, and sisters are. The one who wants to stay connected in a relationship with me. Now, why is this important? Well, understand this. In Scripture, in the New Testament, and most of you know this, but in case you don't, a lot of people say, well, we're all children of God because God loves us. You know, most of you, it's correct. We are all God's creation. But the New Testament specifically points out the children of God are the ones who have accepted Jesus in their heart and have a relationship through Jesus, through what Jesus did with Jesus. Those are the sons and daughters of God. So to be in the family of God, we have to have a relationship with Jesus. So... I know this is unusual timing, but I really felt led to do this right now. I want you to just close your eyes, open your hearts, open your minds right now. And if you're ready for a relationship with Jesus that you, and you've never had one before, or you've been estranged from the family of God in one way or another, Simply, Lord, I want to come home. Jesus, I want you in my heart. You died for all my sins. I am forgiven. I have been redeemed. And in you, I am restored in a relationship with my Heavenly Father. And I am part of the family of God. And for those that have been estranged, I'm coming home. I'm tired of being apart from you, Jesus. I'm coming home. And I know you have prepared a wonderful meal for me at your table. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for empowering me. Come into my life right now. Holy Spirit, come and seal the deal. Seal the deal right now. Seal the deal right now in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you prayed that for the first time, I just 
I want to bless you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for the heart that's been opened up to you. Because God's got a wonderful plan for you. So why are we talking about, as my wife mentioned, it's second Sunday of the new year. We talked about last couple of weeks God's plans and, and vision and purpose for us. But I want to talk about one of the really key visions of this church as we enter into 2024. It has always been this, and I want to reaffirm it today again. It's family. It's family. I try very hard to call our gatherings services, but family gatherings, because that's what it's about. It's about being a part of a family. More than that, it's about being part of a healthy family, a healed, whole family family. Not that family members don't have stuff to deal with and work through. But as we go through this, a healthy family, there's room for the members, for the family, sons and daughters, aunts and uncles, even the one that kind of smells sometimes. <laughs> to find hope. To find belonging, to be loved, to be healed, to be restored, to be brought in, to be embraced. It's family, or in other words, community. And this is important. Because again, what did Jesus say? Who is my mother and brother and sisters? It's the ones who do the will of God, the ones who have a relationship with me. So if I have a relationship with him, and you have a relationship with him, guess what? We're family. We're part of his extended adopted family in faith. And that's who we are. So how does a family act? Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 41 47. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Welcome then. Doing the will of the Father. Everyone who began a relationship with Jesus. About 3,000 souls were added to them. Imagine having 3,000 babies birthed in one day. That's be cool to a family. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So doctrine, word of God, continued in the Truths of God's word. And the truth of the things that Jesus spoke, they stay in the will of God, right? It always goes back to that. And not just doctrines, but fellowship. Fellowship doesn't mean let's hang out and eat. Biblical fellowship, as defined in New Testament scripture, is a, a, a time where the Holy Spirit is present. It's not just you and I hanging out having a cup of coffee, it's you and hanging out, having a cup of coffee with the Holy Spirit there, encouraging each other, building each other. That's pure biblical fellowship. It's coming together in a way that honors God and inviting him to be a part of it. Remember, he said, we're two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there. Hello? You invite him in, Jesus will never turn down a coffee date. Holy Spirit will never say no to a gathering. If you feel like going for a walk and, you, and you're and you walking with somebody, guess what? Jesus would love to go on that walk with you. That's fellowship. So they stay true to the word that Jesus spoke. They stay true in fellowship and they broke bread together. They had meals together. They engaged with, other, with one another. In other words, they built close relationships. And again, breaking bread is also symbolic of union. So they, they they commemorated who Jesus was and what he did in their gathering. They didn't leave him behind. He was part of what they did on a daily basis and in prayers. In other words, they were having conversations. Sometimes they would press in and talk, and sometimes they would listen and hear. Again, doing the will of God. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done 
through the apostles. Remember that word fear is not being afraid necessarily. It means being in awe of the awesomeness of God. How do you know God's awesome? When you allow him and you start seeing what he's doing in your life. I didn't know my wife was amazing until I started to get to know her. Same thing. In a relationship, you realize he's amazing because you're seeing him do amazing things with you as you are connected to him, as you're building your relationship with him. You realize that a family's awesome by spending time with the family. How many of us who've had kids, you know, had friends of your kids come over and they want to always come over for dinner or they always want to come out and hang out at your house because they think you guys are awesome. Well, they think you guys are awesome when they didn't know you, when they didn't have time with you. But when they started coming over and spending time, they realized how awesome you are. You wanted to spend more time. Same thing in our relationship with Jesus and being a part of the family of God and seeing how the kingdom of God is alive. He's working. It's not something we just preach about and talk about, but we are part of what God is doing because he lives in our hearts. His Holy Spirit is alive in us. He loves us and his love is real. And we get to love him back. Now all who believed were together in all things in common and they sold their possessions and goods and they divided them among all as anyone had need. They were there for each other as every family member should be their family. And I'm not talking about where you're enabling somebody. I'm talking about pure, genuine love and support. So continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So it wasn't just about church. It was what they did outside of church. And you guys know this. What we do outside of our family gathering Sunday mornings is more important most of the time than what we do inside. Because that's an extension of your family. If we're going to say our family gathering is like going to the patriarch's house for Christmas, well, when you leave, you're representing your family where you are, wherever you are. So how we carry ourselves, who we are, we represent this family. And there's expectations to that, just like there is in every family. It's normal. It's that outside the realm of normality. They went from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. It wasn't about performing. It wasn't about showing off. It was about just being part of the family and loving each other simply. Praising God, which we did this morning, and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were <laughs> saved, those who were believed and wanted to be part of the family. So the favor of God, that means that God was on what they were doing. He blessed what they were doing. Because it was honoring heaven. What did Jesus say? Who's my brother and sister? He said, the one who does the will of my father, the one who does the will of heaven. So this is where we kind of get into some things in church. And this is what I want to kind of talk about. I want to talk about being a family member versus being a consumer. How many of you guys are family members at ShopRite? Or Stop and Shop? Or Aldi's? Or Leeds? Are, you, are you part of the Aldi family? Collecting the royalties and the blessings of that family? No. You go there, you're a consumer. You buy goods, exchange your money for goods, and you go home. You, there's not a single one of us here that goes, yeah, I'm part of the ShopRite family. That's just a marketing scheme that they want you to think. Because you have a little card that says shop right on it. You're a member. You're not part of that family. You're a consumer. They have something you are taking from them. A family member gives 
supports, receives freely. Remember, in the kingdom of heaven, everything is freely given and freely received. Never forced upon. Jesus does not force upon us salvation. He does not force his Holy Spirit upon us. He does not force conviction on us. It's there if we choose to receive it. It's my choice. And as I receive it, I'm, I give it away. As I am forgiven, I forgive. As I am filled, I pour out. That's what a healthy family does. I don't know how many of you saw a uh, post I, uh, I did on Facebook on Friday. Um, and I don't normally do this, but you might see more of this over the coming months. But the Lord <coughs> gave me a vision, and I want to expand on, on what I shared. As I was praying and thinking through this, I thought about a prophetic word Pat gave a few weeks ago about the meat and the milk. Bible talks about drinking the milk, but his word, Pat's word was it's time for us as a church to start eating the meat of the gospel. You know, let's be grown ups and start eating meat, not be babies drinking on the milk stuff. And the Lord showed me how in a family, young children are always mommy, daddy, can I have, I want, can you give me, can you do this for me? They're taking. No offense, but your kids are consumers. They consume your time. They consume your energy. They consume your money. And everything you have. Not that that's a bad thing in this case, but I'm just saying. But as a child matures into adulthood, what I, the, the vision God was giving me is how a child goes from consuming, taking, wanting, needing all the time, to beginning to be more independent as they grow up. And then they, at some point, it's, the best way I can put it is this. Mommy, as a child, make me lunch, make me this, make that. As you grow up, Mommy, I'm making lunch. Would you like me to make you some too? Is there something I can do for you? Part of growing into adulthood is you're no longer just taking, but you're taking care of yourself. But in doing so, you're also releasing blessing of giving away. You're giving of your heart. You're giving now. You're maturing. And now you are part of the family. You're not usurping the resources of the family. You see a financial need, you give to your uh, parents or whoever's in your household to help with things. That's part of growing up in adulthood. And there will be those times even as a young adult or an adult, where you're in a bad spot and you need your mom or dad to do something for you. But that's not every day all the time at that point. In a church, people come in. You come in, you need the milk. You need to be, you need to receive. And there's many people that came in and have come in over the years who we've told you just need to sit down and let God speak to you. Let God minister you for a while. And then you'll know when to step up and to do and to be. When you get it, people receive. But at some point, as part of a church family, it goes from me being someone who just comes in to get from the pew to me being someone who says, how can I give? God's given me something I want to give. That could look like in talent, ability, sowing into, whether it's financial or otherwise. You know, because every, at a certain age, most families, the mom and dad say, hey, kid, you're an adult now. You want to live here? That's fine. You will, but you need to pay your rent. Sowing into, because there's bills and there's things that, that's just natural things. Um, responsibility a child will walk by there's garbage on the floor they don't pick it up an adult walks by you might grunt a little bit but you pick it up and you throw it away that's responsibility that's maturing into adulthood in a church you walk in oh this needs to be done boom let's get it done 
Let's get it done. How we can strengthen our family. Because in a church, you're only as strong as your family. And if you have a strong family, it's going to strengthen you. It's going to build you. Oh. Hey, Eric, can I ask you just to shut that door for a second for me? So these things happen. So in a family or community, it's a it's where everyone experiences relationship, not consumerism. Consumerism says, I'm going to go to the movies today, so I'm going to pay for my ticket, enjoy the experience, and go home. So many people, that's how they treat church. Whether it's in tithing or whether it's just every day. I'm going to go up, do for the moment, but then once I walk out, I got my fill, I experienced my hour and a half show, I'm done. I might have gotten my popcorn or coffee, I'm done. Being a part of family, there is relationship, there's encounter, there's encouragement. The word family or community, it's a word that comes from the word communion. We take communion. What does that mean? It means we are connecting on a very deep level with the heart of God. There's a connection there. Why? Because God wants to us to connect with him. It's his desire to connect with us, or else Jesus would have done what he did. Remember, since the fall of man, everything Jesus, uh, the Father did, from kings of the Old Testament to prophets of the Old Testament to his law, was to restore the broken relationship. And finally, the perfect solution was Jesus. So from day one, when he created Adam and Eve, they were meant to be in communion with him. And when that communion was torn apart, everything the Father has done since was to restore the relational communion element of who we are with him and in him. It's a relationship with God the Father, with Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. But it's also a relationship as your brother with you or your sister as with you. As uh, Rob said earlier, it's beautiful. A lot of times it's this, but it's supposed to be this first. And out of this comes this, with each other, encouraging each other, loving each other. So what are the values? And I'm going to kind of go through four things here. Our vision is in terms of family, is to create community wherever we go to be an impact on those around us. What does that mean? What the heck does that mean? It's simple. When we have home group at Lauren's house, once in, we're building community with whoever shows up. When we are gathering together, when the men gather next Saturday at the Yellow Rose Diner in a restaurant, and the waiter or waitress is there, we're trying to connect with them. Show them the love of Jesus. Let be a testimony of who we are. We've had opportunities to pray for people there. And there was one time where one of the waitresses literally sat down and we spent, a couple of us spent a half hour with her afterwards talking with her ministry. This is building community wherever we go. At your workplace, same thing, because you carry that spirit of family that's through Christ in you. So what are some of the attributes? Well, one, obviously, love. A family loves one another unconditionally. Listen, we all screw up. We all mess up. We all have very difficult times. But unconditional love says, don't run away from your family. Run to your family. Let your family cover you. Now, part of love is being honest because there are still some natural things we have to deal with. But unconditional love says, I love you because of who you are and whose you are, not because of what you did. So that means I can't unlove you because of what you did. 
You know, it's too easy to unfriend people if you don't like what they say on Facebook or whatever. But unconditional love is you don't unlove them. You continue to love them and you come together. Now, the person has to want to be loved, obviously. John 13, 35 says, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Love will cover a multitude of sins. An atmosphere of unconditional love is an atmosphere for healing. Think about it. When you are loved, that's a foundation for healing to take place. What do we tell people when we pray for healing? Even if the person doesn't get healed right there and then, they felt that you cared enough about them to pray for them, that you loved them, that you took the, the, the minute or two or five or ten to, to spend with them and show concern about their well-being. That's love. So love them. Show them that love. It's an atmosphere of unconditional love. It's an atmosphere of healing. It brings atonement, redemption, restoration, rebuilds, it strengthens, it gives hope, it's encouraging. And that's what we need, we need to do. Now, obviously, we can't force somebody to be loved. They have to want to come in. But if I know that I'm not going to be judged, I'm going to be honest with and within that honesty, there's love. Because, you know, truth and, and, and love go hand in hand, right? You know, I'm, we can't coddle people. We need to be honest with people. But we also, within that, is we love loving restoration. So family is love. Never forget when uh, Sandy happened. And... Our neighborhood, you know, people didn't talk in our neighborhood. You guys, you guys don't remember this, other than a few of us, when Sandy happened in Kingsburg, we were living in Kingsburg and stuff. And you might not even get along with your neighbor. But what happened is, Sandy happened, and all of a sudden, people were helping each other. It's kind of like that New Jersey mentality of, I mess with you, but nobody else is going to mess with you, kind of thing. And that's what we saw happening all over the place. People came together, and that happens in a family. I may not agree with what you're doing, but I'm there for you. I have your back. I will love you. And there's healing in love. This is my command in John 15, 12, that you love one another just as I have loved you. How did, how did he love us? He stretched out his arms and died on the cross. For God so loved the world. For God so loved me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes, that if I believe, choose to believe and come home, will have everything like relationship with my father. It's that simple. So love has got to be a heart of this. So as we see people, as people enter in, our first question should be, how can I overwhelm them with love? How can I destroy them with love? Think about it. How can I destroy them in love? Love opens up God to do his thing. Because it's not my love in the flesh. It's not fake love. It's that comes because I look at you and I perceive you in the way God perceives you. Then I look at you through his eyes. I see you as someone that Jesus died for. So love. Second thing is communication. A healthy family talks. Does not hide things. Dysfunctional families don't talk. They put things under the carpet, right? We don't address important issues. They harbor issues. A healthy family talks for the purpose of bringing resolution and healing to what is going on. That's what a healthy family does. James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The expectation is healing. When you are honest, you're honest for the purpose. You're talking for the purpose of resolution, of res restoring the person. What does Matthew 18 says? If you've got an issue with someone, and that's going to the family member, 
first thing you do is talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Bring healing. Then if that doesn't work, take another family member with you and go and try to bring healing to them. And if that doesn't work, bring the church with you. If that doesn't work, then that's on them. See, if I have to believe that the Holy Spirit lives in me, God is in me, and you as my brother or sister, God lives in you, we can have a disagreement, then I know in my heart that you're a praying person. And you would know in your heart, I'm a praying person. And what I mean by praying person is seeking what God says about the situation. And part of being a family member, knowing those things is, Part of my prayer is, Lord, if I'm wrong, if there's any part of my current stance that's wrong, maybe how even I presented my current stance, even if I wasn't wrong in and of itself, would you show me so I can say I'm sorry and repent? Because the object isn't to be right. It's to restore the relationship. It took a while, but that's what I have to do with my wife all the time. Sometimes she gets mad at me, I get mad at her. And one of the things I have to shift my mind to is, Lord, show me where I was not correct so that I can repent to you and ask her to forgive me. Maybe in what, how I said it, what I said, and why I said it. Whatever the situation may call. We communicate. We share our hearts to bring healing, create an atmosphere of love and mercy and forgiveness and understanding because that becomes a cultural thing. We want to create that culture where there's healing. I don't know how many times to a four-year-old you said, I'm sorry I did that. When I was in the wrong in the way I responded to my daughter. Will you forgive me? Create a cultural and atmosphere of this. Matthew 18, 5 through 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. This is what we just talked about. If he hears you, you've gained a brother. It's been restored. It's this is conflict resolution here, 101. Third thing it's love, it's communication, it's now commitment. You're committed to your family. You're not somebody brought in to do a job and taken out. You're not hitting and running. A family member is committed to the goal and purpose of the family. Something that was shared with me a couple of weeks ago that I just cannot get out of my heart was the difference between someone's gifts and the mandate from God. That really stuck with me. Because you can be so gifted, and if you're gifted, you're gonna you're gonna want to use your gifts, whether it's playing an instrument or teaching or whatever. And you can go anywhere to do that. And there's nothing wrong with it in and of itself. But when God says, Here's my mandate about your gift, all of a sudden God puts parameters around your gift. What do I mean by that? The mandate is God saying, I want you to take your gift, and this is what how I want you to use it and where. If you are uh, being called to be part of this family, this is your mandate. Mandate says, this is where you belong, your gift. Not that you can't bless, but be a blessing, but your priority becomes the family. Your heart becomes the family. Your commitment is the family. And within that mandate is, how can I grow the family? How can I build this family? How can I strengthen this family? That really stuck with me in a major way. It's, there's no personal agendas, and you understand the heartbeat of the family, and you live that out. Ephesians 2.19, so then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. 
God has you where he has you to fulfill. What did Jesus say? Who's my brothers and sisters? The one who does the will of my father. To fulfill his will in that family household he's placed you in. It kind of sets those uh, parameters and, and it sets things in line. Because now you know what you're working towards, what you're doing, what your purpose, what his plans are for you. A healthy family, part of the commitment, spends time together because they're committed to the whole thing, but they also spend time together. We want to be together, and we're not together just to have fun because we can. And you know what? We always do. We always have fun when we come together like this and in other ways. We want to be together. We worship, we pray, we encourage, we play, we intercede, we laugh. That's what a family does. Hebrew 10.25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm so thankful for media. I'm so thankful for social media, especially during the time of COVID because it kept us connected. And what one of the reasons for those that remember we chose Zoom over just Facebook Live for a long time is because we wanted our family members to continue to connect with each other, not just watch a television show. And I'm thankful for all of you that are on social media right now watching us, but we want to encourage you, if not this family, get into a family, be a part of a family, because then people can pour into you and love you the way you need to be loved, as well as you can release and pour out what you need to pour out to love others. It's a relationship. It's a flowing, growing thing. Not forsaking the assembly isn't about not coming to church. It's about not breaking the family relationship bonds, staying close to each other, when you know what's going on in the family, you know how to pray for the family. When you know when a family member is in a situation, you're asking God to intercede. You know how to spend. You know how to love. You know how to encourage. You know how to build. And granted, as we grow as a church, we're not going to know the deepest inner thoughts of every single person. But within the family, there's, that's natural. You're going to have a brother closer to another sibling than maybe the third or or a sister closer to one sibling or another. And that's okay. But it's about loving and coming together. The last thing is relationships, which is growing together. Everyone has a very valuable point. When, when somebody is not there doing what they're part of the family, it's missed. There is a lack. And you feel you just miss them in your heart. You miss their spirit. I always talk about when you come to church, bring your fire. Because, man, even if your fire is a tiny twig, little tiny flame on a twig, bring it. Because somebody else might be bringing a log that's inflamed six feet high. But we put it all together. It adds to what's going on. It adds to what's going on. It builds what God wants to do. It burns within our hearts. It stirs heaven. It, and things, awesome things begin to happen. Everyone is very valuable. What you have, your talent, your gifts, your anointing, all those things are important. I just want to honor somebody. And Joe, forgive me for honoring you in public. I know you don't like public stuff. But you know what? We've had a need for somebody to really run with social media. The other night, Joe said, I'm good at that. I'll do it. That's exactly was a confirmation of what God wants to do. I'm so thankful. Good. Someone else, I can do this. I want to step up and lead in this area. and take. I'm seeing a, not let me do what everyone else is doing so I can be like everyone else. But where is the need? A family member says, Mom, Dad, Brother, Sister, what needs to be done? How can I help? What do I need to do to take part? What is missing that I can fill in? 
whether it's temporary or maybe long term. What do, what can I offer you? That's what a healthy family goes. Our vision is to equip the saints for the work of the kingdom. What does that mean? My father's will. Who are my brothers and sisters? The one who does the will of my father. Bringing the father's will. We're committed to one another in these relationships and we, we want to see, we have a desire to see each, each other grow. I want to see you grow. I keep telling the worship team, I can't wait. I don't want to leave worship anymore because I don't have to. Because we have so many amazing worship leaders now. And that's what you want to see. We're not afraid of someone, quote, taking our spot because I know there's another spot that needs to be uh, taken over or dealt with or something else. We're excited to see growing people coming together. So the question becomes, by putting on your heart, where do you see a need? And sometimes even if I don't want to do it, this is what God keeps bringing up to me. That's what I keep seeing. So I need to do it. Maybe nobody's taking out the garbage, so I guess I'm going to do it. I'm going to take out the garbage. But another element of relationship is new family members. A family dies if it's not growing. A family dies if it's not growing. A family legacy dies if there's nowhere to carry it on. How do we do that? We continue to grow. We continue to bring new family members in. We invite them to be part of this family. And I want to just honor you guys. As I said last week, it's been awesome to see so many new faces being encouraged to come and come back and being invited. But it's going to take all of us to do this together. But it begins with what happens outside of our family gathering, the relationships we build outside the family gathering, and then bring them in. We become a mentor. Whether you consider yourself a mentor or not, when you start building a relationship with somebody and encouraging somebody, guess what? You're a spiritual mentor. You don't have to label yourself, but that's what you are. God puts you in that position to start ministering, to releasing his love. And what you're doing is you're setting an example of what love looks like. And then you are a mentor. And we disciple. And you know what? Here's the beautiful thing about a family. When you start mentoring and loving somebody, you're not doing it on your own. When they become a part of this family, now they're surrounded by the other family members who will love and care for them as well. So as we press into this next year, think about our family. Think about what God is calling you in your role in this family because we want to create family. We've been trying to create family with the Elks and encourage them. We've been trying to create family with the leadership in our town. We love them. Why? Because God loved them first. Wherever we go, this is what our call is. This is what our desire. And if you are feeling lost, if you are feeling orphaned, know God is calling you to his family right now. I want you all to stand with me. Thank you, Lord. Just open up your hearts again. Close your eyes and just position yourselves to receive what God is doing right now. Luke, if you can just come and play something like me, Luke. Luke, if you can come and just play. Thank you, Lord. you've been floundering around, there's two things that are happening. Either you haven't found a family, or you've not chosen to come into family. You've not accepted the mandate. So Holy Spirit, would you come right now and bring 
any revelation of which one which one of us is. And Lord, just come. Call this into your family right now. We want to come home. Thank you for every single person here this morning. I thank you for every single person that was strategically designed to be here today for a reason. For those that are feeling right now, strategically. So I thank you for what you're doing in them. So, Father. and start to see themselves not as orphans or estranged call them home let them know they are loved I want you to know you are loved we want you to know you are loved so what my wife declared here this morning was not out of left field it has to do with this are estranged because they've been hurt. People choose me not to come in because they don't want to be hurt again. So Holy Spirit, just come and, and just come with a wave. A wave of love and, and the blood of Jesus. Just come and cover all the wounds right now and bring healing to every heart. Bring healing to every heart. We restore every heart here today and those listening. On social media right now. Bring healing and restoration right now. Heal every wound. Just taking a few moments just to rest in Jesus. We're almost done for the morning, but just rest in Him. Let Him minister to you. I feel like He's pouring out love right now. And this love is just healing those wounds and bringing clarity to what he wants for you and showing you. And this is the family he has enfolded me in. And he 
sent me here. You understand? He sent me here. So if you're lost, God is embracing you. He sent me a shepherd and he just wants to surround you and embrace you. This is a fact. And God has called me home. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I just want you to say in the name of Jesus I just release all bitterness anger hurt, things that have kept me estranged that have kept me away that have kept me from coming fully in and I thank you for your blood that washes those away and gives me a clean fresh start today thank you Father. thank you Jesus thank you Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I feel like somebody else has another word before we close. But God, to release something in someone's heart today for us. That's you. Please come on. He also said that we are his bride and he's coming for, for his bride. So we are just so a bride walking in him. Why? And righteous. So he sees us as righteous, you know, this is Jesus' righteousness. So we are pure, we are holy, we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Everything that when we uh, accept Jesus, right? He died for us, so He took everything, all our sins. So He's saying we we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and we are walking in purity, righteousness, and that's what He's coming for. He's coming for the bride. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Okay. I just kept seeing Jesus' face and. I feel like my whole journey and more than that, I just want to see your face more. And I see it, but I don't see it. So I just want to press into that more that you could just seek his face, seek his presence, seek Jesus, and just everything comes clear. You just can see his face. That's our prayer. Everyone there, you just see his face and see his face. And he just comes, he just comes. This is the B. L O V E. Spell it again. L O V E. Come on. This is one of the hardest things to accept for us as people that we are loved. That there is love for each of us as individuals and even together. From what we've been through, from what we've seen, what we've been taught, whether in your family or secular, it doesn't matter. This is probably the hardest meat to chew. Only if we get it from the world. But if we go shopping in our father's market, this meat is so tender and succulent, you don't even have to chew it. As soon as you absorb it into the mouth, it's going to melt. And it's going to fill your body and fill your blood. Every cell of your being is going to be filled with the love of God. And when we all accept that, when we're all connected. We're all loved. We all love each other. 
then we are all going up each time and every day. Yes. So Father, we thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the mandate to be a part of this family. Thank you for the mandate to be a part of your family. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that will help us to carry on the will of the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood for making a way for us to come back to the family and be a part of your family, God. Thank you for your love that was released in baptism, the spirit of love that engulfs us in the desire to be with you, want to be with you, and through you, be with one another, encouraged, built up, strengthened, and released to do your will wherever we are. In Jesus' name. So we just thank you, Papa. Thank you, Lord. God bless you all. And uh, just so you know, there's a family party next Sunday, 11 a.m., downstairs. So we're all invited to come to our party, especially if you've got a live on YouTube. Come to our family party here next Sunday, 11 a.m. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Oh, uh-huh.